I'm talking about now. Now all I can see is chaos and confusion and panic. <laughs> Yeah. So it seems like everybody's still on a beer, but they're maybe not that into hardware. Um, I'm into hardware. Um, okay, let's not start with that. Let's start with my name. I'm Joachim Vegas. I'm into hardware. Uh, some of you I know are into hardware because I know you guys. And I want to start off with a quick, who has tried to reverse engineer their badge or reprogram it? Cool. Do you have different blinking lights than the defaults? Awesome. Great. Uh, so, Gotola, that's like my nick handle. I don't really know. I usually use my own name. Uh, I'm almost a Bachelor of Science of Computer Science, but not really. I still have something to go. Uh, I work at F-Secure as a security consultant, but I don't have the logo here because this presentation actually has very little to do with my job. Um, I'm going to talk about implanting hardware. And this is something that when I told to this, uh, about this to a colleague, he asked, uh, are you going to do a live demo? That's going to be kind of hard. And I was like, yeah, I'm going to do a live demo, which I'm actually not. Uh, but he was thinking that it's actually an operation to implant hardware into your body, right? Uh, this is not that kind of implanting. This is about implanting devices with hardware, not your body or your pet or any other thing. Um, a quick overview. I'm going to talk about what are implants and what I mean with it, because this might not be uh, clear to everybody. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about one vulnerability in one device that I've been looking at that I got to borrow from a friend of mine. And then I'm going to explain how I made an implant for that device. And in the very end, I'm going to do a run through like how the attack kind of works and what are the, what are the kind of technical steps needed to, to go through with it. Um, implants. And I'm talking about nasty hardware attached to other hardware. This is the kind of stuff that you would think uh, NSA does when they implant your laptop with an extra chip that will have a hardware trojan on your, on your laptop or something. Uh, for some reason, my clicker isn't working, now it is. Um, key loggers, you could imagine that's a, uh, that as an implant. You could either implant a laptop with a key logger or a regular USB keylogger could be seen as attaching hardware, implanting hardware. Uh, then there are credit card skimmers, which I think somebody today talked about a little bit. I think it was Antti. He was uh, mentioning that this is a way of copying cards. So you add, attach an extra piece of hardware just to steal some information. And yeah. Mm, so there's, I'm, I have want to tell you about this implant lifecycle. You attach the implant, and after that, the implant does something. It either manipulates the environment that it's in or steals some data from there. And then it either exfiltrates the data, or then you have to recover it just so you don't get caught. Um, this is not what I did, but this is an example. Uh, this is a credit card skimmer. So you put in your card, and this extra, this extra plastic part actually has a chip inside and will just steal your credit card while you use the ATM. Um, I'm going to explain first a little bit about this vulnerability and what I'm implanting, how I'm implanting it. Um, I'm targeting a device called the Seclave. The Seclave is a password manager. It's like a hardware password manager. So that means it's one device with one master password and inside it, you store all your other passwords. And it just puts everything in memory and encrypts it. And the key is, the key is stored on the device, but it's protected by your master password. There are a lot of things that could go wrong. Uh, not all of them did. But there are some things that could be improved with this device. Uh, the user interface is funny, and the company is Swedish. <laughs> yeah, this is what it looks like. Uh, you can see that the interface is going to be funny because it only has one button and one screen. Uh, it's actually a joystick. And in the very corner, you can say USB. So that's how you kind of get the input to the computer. You attach it by USB, and it will just turn up as a keyboard. Uh, this is what it looks like when you take off the, the casing. And I'm going to show you a little bit in here. Uh, this obviously is the screen. This is the joystick. 
Uh, this is the USB. But then we have some chips. We have one chip here. And this I'm going to be talking about the crypt, because it's a cryptographically secure storage. And this is the flash. This is the flash that keeps your passwords. And there's a microprocessor under the screen. It's not visible, but it is there. I've actually never looked at what it is, but we'll see more soon. So this is like an architecture overview of that picture I just had there. There's the crypt. It's an Atmel chip, and it's got your master key in it. It's got the master key that encrypts all your passwords, which then are stored in this flash store, uh, which is also an Atmel chip. So I actually assume that there's an Atmel microcontroller as well, because this would make sense. And then there's a user interface. I don't know what that talks, but it doesn't matter. Here, we are talking SPI, which is a physical level bus protocol. And this is another protocol. These are just ways for the chips to communicate with each, uh, each other. Um, a little bit more about that later. Yeah, so this really is just a flash chip. It's memory. I think it's got like a kilobyte or 10 kilobytes or 100 kilobytes. Uh, it's enough to keep most people's all passwords and usernames, like all the usernames to your Facebook, your Google, and your bank, and I don't know what else you use. Um, then there's the crypt. And this is, this is kind of one of the most important parts, because it's got your master, not your master password, but it's got your encryption keys in it. And the, of course, encryption keys should never be leaked. They should always be securely stored. Uh, this is actually a tamper-proof storage. So while it's, uh, while it's in rest, so when the chip is turned off, you can't read the contents. Like You can dump a flash chip, you can dump a ROM chip, and you can dump the flash of a microcontroller, but you can't actually dump this. You have to put it on, and then you have to give it a password. Uh, it's a three-byte password, uh, which you might laugh at. But it's actually, if you try f four times and fail, it will just break itself. Then you can re recover. You can't recover anything anymore from there. And so, so actually, this is the way that they protect your. This is like the weakest. This is the best vector for attack is is to get into this chip, but you can't do it because the, it's a well-made chip. And I'm just going to assume that you can't break into it. That I'm just going to make the security. Uh, expectations. I expect this to not be breakable. The Atmel uh, microcontroller, I don't know about it, but it's not one of these tiny ones. Uh, it's probably something bigger. It might be something like what we have in the badges. Um, I could imagine it would be good enough for this. Um, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about these protocols. So we have the serial through peripheral interface and the two-wire interface, uh, which is some of you might know it as I2C which is inter-inter-circuit. And the inter-inter-circuit, it's a simple protocol. It's got data and a clock, and then you share ground. That's, that's all you need to signal. Uh, it's a physical layer, so you just kind of put bits in, and bits come out in the other end. Uh, it goes over, over electrical, uh, electrical lines, so just either cables or your traces on your PCB. It's a primary replica, so the primary will always be talking to a replica chip, which means that there's one person, or like not person, <laughs> one, one chip that will kind of own the data bus, and it can ask the, the replica device for some information. Like in this case, we're asking for the, for the encryption key. Um, here's the setup, which is from a couple months ago at Technohack in Tallinn. I was, I was looking at it. This is the first time so I was putting an oscilloscope into these things and trying to read it with an Arduino uh, didn't work out very well because I was just like bit banging it and it didn't really work. But uh, this shows where we are. We are at the two-wire interface bus. So we're just sniffing to that one and looking at what information we can gain. Um, here's what we gained, what I gained when I, I was looking at this. So. I hope all of you have seen the sequence diagram. If you haven't, they're cool. You should draw them. Uh, this is also a good way to model your own protocols if you ever make them and try to look at flaws in them. Like now, we're going to see this one flaw. When we put on the hardware password manager, it's going to ask us for a password. You're going to input it with a joystick. And you might ask, how do you do that? 
I, I, I won't tell you because then you can like limit the mystery of interfaces. And then it's gonna the microcontroller is gonna make a hash, so it's gonna hash that password into a three byte uh, digest. And this digest is actually the password to open up the encrypted memory. So this is a tamper-proof memory that we can't get into unless we have this password. Uh, now that we have it, it's going to tell us, tell us whether the password was right or if it was wrong. And if it was wrong for the fourth time, then it's, it's just going to break itself, and we'll never recover anything from that chip anymore. Um, after this, the microcontroller is going to do a read key command. It's just going to read a part of the memory. And then, then it happens, the, one of the cooler parts. So the crypto chip, I'm just going to speed out the master key and just give it to the microcontroller. This is, this is by design. Uh, after that, when the user chooses the password to decrypt, uh, it's going to actually, the microcontroller is going to ask the flash, so the store, the password store for that one encrypted password. And after that, the microcontroller decrypts it and shows it to the user or sends it to the USB, depending on how you are going to use this device. So these ones that are highlighted with red, that's where very sensitive data goes. Because the master key is the key to all your passwords, and the three byte digest is the key to the key to all your passwords. And I actually really sent an email to the company about this. And actually, I'm going to tell you later what they said. Um, so two wire sniff. This is like the name of my GitHub repo, which was the best name to like. When you make a GitHub repo, you have to name your projects. Uh, so this is what I named my project, where I'm making a sniffer to sniff those, those orange pro protocol kind of those orange lines in that protocols. I'm going to steal the three byte password. I'm going to steal the, the encryption key. Uh, so it's tiny, because this is going to fit inside the password manager. Uh, it's got hardware to do the two-wire interface communication. Uh, it's going to EEPROM to store stuff for longer whiles. And these are really cheap. They're two years a piece. So this is really like, this is not nation state level. This is, this is like hardware hacker, hobbyist thing. Uh, I'm using an AT Tiny 45, which some of you might know. This is like the little brother of, of these Atmel chips. Uh, they just seem to pop up everywhere. And I think this is largely due to Arduinos just being everywhere. And everybody knows how to program them. And yeah, it's connected to the data and the clock signals, and then to ground and power, just so we can power it up. Uh, we can read the EEPROM with a programming device. So when you're reading the sniff data, you actually have to detach the implant and attach it to a programmer. Uh, it's less than 1K code. Last time I compiled it, it was something like 320 bytes, uh, which unfortunately I wrote in assembly because I need to have fine control over timing. So now it's a set of code that's like completely unworkable with unless you made it from scratch. So I'm going to publish it, but uh, the actual like, advantage for anybody is kind of questionable. Uh, so what this chip does, it sits on the TWI bus, and it listens to everything. Whether it's an address or a request for data or data coming back from the, from the crypt just the encrypted storage, it's just going to listen to everything, and it's going to store everything to RAM. And after it's in RAM, it's going to copy it all to EEPROM. So EEPROM is for like, this is reprogrammable memory that will last forever. So when you shut off your, your microcontroller, the RAM will obviously disappear because it's, it's RAM. But EEPROM will stay. EEPROM is forever. No, it's about 10 years. Uh, <laughs> so here, hopefully, uh, the first time the user uses this device, uh, we're going to get some data, and, and hopefully that's good. Uh, so this is what the layout looks like right now, because we implanted this device. So we have this sniffer EEPROM, sniffer with an EEPROM. This is the implant that we have. And this is, this is a tiny chip that we're going to put inside the casing uh, right next to the battery. It fits there. Uh, but I don't have the battery, and I broke the case. So I never actually put this thing together again. Uh, realistically, you would have to be very careful when you're breaking the package and implanting your, your nasty device, because otherwise you'll leave traces. And these people who are using this password manager, they will never touch it. 
Mm. So here, this is when you do a backup, you can show the encryption key. So this is the key for the backups. And this is how I'm verifying uh, what I'm actually looking for in the dumps. And so then I dump the EEPROM, and there's a 3-byte pa byte password. And here's the 16-byte AES128 key. Uh, so now we, we have everything. And this is done not with an oscilloscope, not with a, a logic analyzer, not even with a microcontroller development board. This is the bare bones die, uh, like a chip. It's a DIP8. So it's one of those tiny ones that look like a, they look like a spider, right? Because they got eight legs. Mm, now we're going to go through that attack flow one more time, really, really slowly. Because it turns out I have a lot of time left, and I've been chasing this through really fast. Uh, first, we're going to acquire the target. So let's say that some of you are using a hardware password manager. So I'm going to steal it from you. How I do this, I don't know. Maybe I'm staying over at your place, or maybe I'm at the airport checking your luggage. Or there's some way that I can acquire it. I can carefully open it and make four, four fast solderings and put your package together. That should take 15 minutes, 10 minutes maybe. And then, then I'm going to give it to you without noticing anything. So this is, this is what we should all, of course, watch out for, like put the glitter on your laptop screws to make sure that if somebody opens them, they will never get the same glitter back on. Uh, after, yeah, so that's uh, acquired device. We implant the sniffer. Then we make sure the user enters their password. Because if they don't enter the password, there will be no data on the EEPROM. So we have to make sure that the user uses this for long enough, maybe a day or a week, depending on how much they use this device. Mm. And because this is the first, this is pretty much the first data that is going on the bus. Uh, when you enter your password, that's when the encryption keys come. So every time somebody uses it, we actually are getting the, the encrypted passwords or the key to the encrypted passwords. Uh, then we're going to acquire the device again. So this might be I'm over at the next wine and cheese dinner, or maybe uh, your return flight from, from abroad is coming, and we're checking your luggage again. This time, we're going to take out the chip and extract the, the secrets from the implant. So the implant, uh, we're just going to put in the programmer, read it on the computer. Then we have a dump. And, and there we have your, your master keys. After that, we might want to dump your flash or steal your backups. Uh, we also need some way to get, like, get hold of the actual encrypted passwords. But this is, uh, this is not the hard. That's mainly a technical feat, like a technical feat, because this is not designed to be secure. This is designed to be secured by that password, by that master key that we just stole. Yeah, so that's the post-processing. You might want to reverse engineer the backup software to know what kind of uh, in ciphers and what kind of modes of operations they're using in it. Uh, I didn't do all of this. I was mainly interested in how, how can I make a very, very tiny sniffer. Uh, so mitigations. How do you protect yourself against this? So. Any device you have, whether it's a phone or a tablet or a password manager, or maybe it's a PDA. I think they had those in the 80s. And so don't get your device acquired. This is something like keep your password on your all, at all the times. Uh, don't put your password manager into your uh, luggage to put in the, into the plane. Actually, just bring it with you. And the other thing you do is make tampering visibles. So there are security seals you could use, where you can see if somebody has taken off a seal and unscrewed some stuff, or if somebody has cracked open a package, you could just have a seal there to make sure that, uh, to make sure that it hasn't been uh, tampered with. Sometimes this is as a feature. There might be something that says warranty void. If the warranty is void, then also your security is void. So that's, that's a good sign. Your security is void, given that somebody else voted the guarantee. If you did it yourself, that's fine by me. Um, the last thing you do is when somebody comes to you and says, hey, somebody implanted my hardware, or like, your hardware can be really easily implanted, just say, this is not a valid scenario. Uh, maybe you just extract. 
Maybe you just extracted your, maybe you just excluded this attack scenario from your, from your like, at, you, from your set of possible attacks. And when I was talking to Seclave, I was asking, do they know about this? And they said, yeah, they know. Uh, they didn't protect it against, uh, against this. Uh, or they did, but not strongly, because this is something that's really hard to do. Uh, making tamper-proof and tamper-evident casings is something that you would have like workshops on, on how to redo tamper-evident stuff, like how to make it look like it's not tampered with. Uh, I asked the guys, like, what are your attack scenarios? And they said, cold attacks, which means that if somebody steals your device, just takes it, they can't extract anything. And that's true. I wasn't able to do that, but this is also the only thing I've tried. And the second thing they said is that uh, if you have a malicious host, a USB host that is malicious, then that one shouldn't be able to extract any of the memory on the, on the microcontroller. These, these were like the main concerns that, was, that were used during the design. So in that way, they just said, like, ah, oh, they're interested in my slides. They maybe want to see my presentation. But really, they're not going to fix it. And fixing it is like you can raise the difficulty of it and the price. But uh, I, I think you know trusted platform modules, which you have on your phones and some laptops. Uh, I think somebody was uh, was dumping one of those, and I think they cost like hundred thousand or a million to do it, to just to get like one person's stuff out. So you're, it's still going to be possible. So they wanted to keep the device cost low, just. Don't consider it a valid scenario. Uh, here are a couple of pointers. The codes on GitHub, I think I pushed like three hours ago, because that's when I fixed the last bugs. And uh, there's a Hackaday project where I wrote a little bit about what I learned while I was doing this. Um, there was quite a lot of things that I, I hadn't done before. I hadn't deal, dealt so much with timing issues, because here we are talking about the 100 kilohertz signal. So you're not going to write debug messages into a serial port if your data is 10 times faster than your serial port. And then there's some other, other stuff about, about uh, basics, like where do you get an oscilloscope when you really need one? <laughs> yeah. Um, that's all. I still have 20 minutes, apparently. So if you have any questions, I'm really glad to ask. Ask. Answer, of course. Yeah. I can repeat the question if you just tell it. Okay. Yeah. So the question is, um, I only have 256 bytes of memory in the EEPROM. And when that's full, what's going to happen? Like, what if this guy is using this implant for a month? Uh, using it uh, a month, maybe 60 times, uh, will my EEPROM overflow, or am I going to lose some of the data? No, that's not going to happen. This is a lot more simple than that, because I know exactly what bytes are going on the bus, uh, so I actually know how many bytes I'm going to record, and those are going to be the first stuff that goes there. So it's kind of deterministically I know what data I'm looking for. So I actually have a fixed size buffer, and we just override it every time you boot the device. So that's the way I handled it. You could have done it in a more hard way, like putting a country into the beginning. But then you need to do s consider stuff like, what if somebody turns it off before you upgrade the counter? That's hard. Any other questions? I don't uh, remember seeing a picture of your actual device. Do you have a picture of it? Yes, but I think it's the ones that I put like this, uh, this white blurred out. Uh, oh, actually, so that's uh, it. OK, that's your device. That's my device. Uh, it, that's when it's not attached. And when I'm debugging my stuff, I'm using something that looks like this. Yeah, but uh, if you would make it, how small would it be? 
I mean, obviously, it would fit inside the device, supposedly. Yes, so do you know these uh, deep A chips? Ah, so that's... The real th that, that, that is the implant. Okay. Uh, so it, it has no external hardware. It's only got that microcontroller. And here, here I'm attaching it to the serial data and the serial clock, and then the voltages. And they're just sharing voltage. Uh, in reality, I, of course, have also... Uh, some probes here to actually attach voltage into the into the system, but in a real case scenario, that would be coming from the from the battery. But I remove the battery because working with batteries is hard. Working with electricity is easy. No. Oh, hi. Uh, so, did you manage to dump the storage from the device, and what was the key that was used to prote protect the uh, memory, and was it like on offline brute forceable, the data? No. Um, I don't understand your question. Like, uh, there was this storage module, module in the device? Yeah, uh, um, let's, let's, so, like you were talking about yeah, this one. This, yeah. yeah, so, could you get access to that, uh, those contents in yeah. that one? Yeah. So yeah. those contents, if you steal a person's device, you can you can take all of those contents. Yeah. And the uh, key length was something like uh, AES 128. Uh, okay. So you're not going to break that, unfortunately. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Unless you know a backdoor, which or I hope has, you don't. Or it has less than perfect random, when it's made. Yeah. So actually, that's a good question. Uh, that's another thing I was looking at in the beginning: is uh, how do they generate randomness? When you put on the device the first time, it's going to ask you to wiggle the button 150 times. <laughs> okay, thanks. That's how they generate the random data. Yeah. The device is going to uh, reset uh, after four failure uh, times, you said, yeah. when uh, the information about uh, attempts is stored. So the information about the attempts is stored on the same chip as the secret data. So that's a feature. The f uh, it's a feature of the crypto chip. That it has in itself, it has of course well hidden memory because it's a tamper uh, proof memory. And in that tamper proof memory, that's where the counters are stored. So you're actually asking for the counters every time you, the microcontroller is gonna ask, is this the right password? And if it's not, then the crypt itself is gonna uh, de like, uh, change one byte in the EEPROM. So uh, you cannot access this uh, memory and. No, no. So, so I think the scenario you're thinking about is, what if we could just overwrite that into a big number again and again? Then we could easily try the three-byte password. And uh, it, <laughs> this is not as a feature. And you would probably have to decap it and do some very microscopic scale stuff. And this is, again, an attack in the range of 100,000 euros just to get time on the microscope. I have just a quick question. What, what hashing algorithm is used? So what handshake? Ha hashing algorithm used hashing. for the digest. I have, I have no idea. This is another interesting idea because it's got a, when you put in the password, it's got a fixed set of words that you're going to pick by first picking the first letter, then it's going to suggest all the second letters until you find that one word, and then you enter another word in the same way. And then it just magically turns that into three bytes. I have no idea how this happens. And I would probably have to dump the firmware to know that. Uh, dumping the firmware, you might find out a lot of other things. Like maybe there's, a, maybe there's a USB exploit that you could do. So that over USB, you could just send it some bad data. And then, then hopefully it will crash. And later you just make a rough chain and exploit and all that cool stuff that I have no idea how to do yet. Yeah. OK. Great. I think, I think that's all for me, then, if there's no more questions. Uh, thanks. And if you're interested, no, actually, no, I'm not doing live demos today. Sorry. <laughs> yeah.